What does Canada's closest ally think about our government's response to some of the country's most serious national security issues? I'm Mercedes Stevenson, and the West Block begins now. From Canada's shift in position on the Israel-Hamas conflict to the rising threat of anti-Semitism, to Iranian agents operating in Canada and our military spending. I'll talk about all of that with the U.S. Ambassador to Canada. And as the House of Commons breaks for the holidays, we look at the political stories that dominated Parliament. Canada significantly shifted its position on the Israel-Hamas war last week, with the Trudeau government calling for what it calls a sustainable ceasefire. Canada also voted for a UN resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire. This means that Canada and the United States are no longer on the same page publicly when it comes to the war. The U.S. was one of 10 countries to vote against the non-binding resolution at the UN. But behind the scenes, the White House has been cautioning the Israeli government to use restraint in Gaza and address what President Biden has called indiscriminate bombing. The president was expressing concerns again, as I said, uh, about uh, the civilian casualties that we've seen. Um, and again, it's in reflective of our constant efforts to urge the Israelis to be as precise and careful as possible. Joining me now is the U.S. Ambassador to Canada, David Cohen. Ambassador Cohen, always nice to see you. Thank you for joining us. It is great to see you. And uh, this, this will be, I think, our last on-air interview of the year. So we can uh, look forward to an equally exciting 2024. And we will absolutely be having you back. And a belated happy Hanukkah to you as well. Thank you very much. I, I know it's a, it's a difficult time for a lot of the Jewish community right now, and, and particularly for those who are in Israel, and it's a difficult time for people in Gaza too. And it's a war that has been increasingly dividing people, hardening positions. And we saw that interesting shift in Canada's position last week that, that struck me because it is very different than the U.S. position. The U.S. has not called for a ceasefire. Were you warned that that change was coming or, or were you surprised by it? Look, I was not surprised by it. I sort of see the tea leaves as you do and anyone who is paying attention. In terms of the vote on the resolution, it wasn't surprising at all because, as you said at the top of the report, Canada, New Zealand, Australia released a statement 24 hours before the resolution basically advocating for, um, for, for a ceasefire. Um, but that's, I think when you talk about this word dividing people, it is dividing people, but there, there is one thing that I think everybody agrees with, which is this war has to end. Um, we have to understand and we have to remember how we got here, which is Hamas illegally launched a terrorist attack against Israel, butchered 1,200 civilians, brutally murdering them, women, children, um, allegations of, of sexual assault against women. Um, Hamas is a terrorist organization, and that is why the United States' position is that Israel has to have the absolute right to defend itself, consistent with international norms and standards. And as you've said, um, the United States is advocating, talking to Israel, and saying we need you to be more careful with your defense and with your assaults in Gaza because of the impact on civilians. Um, as recently as in the last 48 hours, um, that message has been reiterated to Israel by Jake Sullivan, and Israel has, ex has expressed its intent to comply with that request, and we now need to make sure that the results um, comply with the statement of intent. Ambassador, one of the most frightening things that has come out of this conflict has been the spread of anti-Semitism, um, attacks on Jewish people, and I'm not talking about in Israel, I'm talking about in Canada, in the United States, in Europe, fears of them being targeted, rhetoric that's out there that um, I would dare to say three months ago people would have never dared say it in public. There's a lot of concern in the Jewish community, and there's concern in the Canadian national security community, too. I've spoken to senior members of the RCMP, of CSIS, of the National Security Infrastructure, and they are very worried about the rise of neo-Nazi groups and their capabilities, including one particular group known as Adam Waffen. Uh, they are believed to have pretty significant weapons capabilities. There's been some arrests in those cases. I know they exist in the United States, too. 
what are your thoughts on the risks that we are facing right now from a national security perspective? So I think this is a, this is a very serious issue, and it's an issue that only now are people be, being, beginning to realize the significance of it. And when you talk about a group like Adam Waffen Group, you have to understand that anti-Semitism and hatred constantly bubbles just beneath the surface. This is not new on October 7th with Hamas's terrorist attacks on Israel. It's always bubbling just beneath the surface. And every once in a while, there may be an external event and there's a, I mean, I describe it as like a little breach in the surface and it, and it pops up. In my memory, this is the most serious of those breaches triggered by um, the October 7 terrorist attacks on Israel. And, it is, and they are frightening. They are frightening. They are sad. And I think it is, I can't comment on Europe. I don't know as much. But for Canada and the United States, it is particularly difficult because hatred, bigotry, intolerance, neo-Nazi verbiage, certainly physical attacks or threats of physical attacks on Jews, on Palestinians, on Muslims. This is not what we stand for. Our moral code is, our moral code does not accept that type of behavior or conduct, but it is occurring with increasing frequency. It occurs on the streets. It occurs behind the scenes with threats of occurring on the streets. It's happening in synagogues and Jewish community centers. Um, I remember, I remember two weekends ago hearing the news out of the United States of three Palestinian students who were shot on the streets of Burlington, Vermont. Turns out not, not by a Jew, not by, but just by a guy. Um, and this is, the, this is what the product is of that type of irrational hatred, bigotry, and as I said, it, it is not what we stand for as a country, not what the Canada stands for as a country, but how you bring this under control is, is one of the more complicated questions. I don't have an easy answer to it, but there has to be a continued universal condemnation by everyone of that type of a reaction to what's happening in the Mideast. Iran is behind uh, a lot of what has been happening in the Mideast, backing Hamas, and, and there's a significant presence here in Canada that we've been talking about uh, on global news all fall, and, and I'm speaking about the Iranian regime, not the Persian people. Um, High-level members of the regime vacationing in Canada, visiting Canada. It's led folks like Erwin Kotler and others, uh, and, and some Americans as well, American lawmakers, to call on the Canadian government to declare the IRGC, the military wing of the regime, to be a terrorist entity. It is considered one in the United States. Would you like to see the Canadian government do that? So, um, to use one of my favorite lines of the last couple of weeks, that question is above my pay grade. <laughs> So I'm going, to, I'm going to smile and politely decline to answer it, but the, but the premise of the question is, is right. I mean, these are these elements of 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 the Iran regime, um, which are, as you point out, operating freely and openly in Canada, um, have been condemned as terrorist organizations in the United States, um, and it's in a sense it's the perfect question to follow. The question that we were just talking about is. There's a, there, there has to be a universal and consistent and strong counter, counterbalance and counterattack to the, these elements of extremist, violent, irrational, um, bigoted, and, and hating organizations and speech. I mean, that, that has to be the first step to be getting to push that back below the surface again um, so that it is not something that Canadians or Americans are living in fear of in their day-to-day -day lives. One last question for you connected to threats, but uh, perhaps much more concrete ones than existential. Defense spending, something I know that the American government would like to see more of from Canada. We've still not announced replacements for the tanks that we've set to Latvia and Ukraine. Uh, we have three days of ammunition if there's a war and no sign of new defense spending yet on the horizon. I know you're an optimistic guy and you always tell me that you believe right. the Canadian government is going to follow through, but there's so far has been no developments there. Does that concern you? 
so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to use the word concern because it honestly would be too strong. I mean, there's no secret to the fact that the United States and I believe that Canada needs to invest more in its defense preparedness. Not because the United States wants them to do it, it is for the benefit of Canadians. Everything, that you, everything in the litany that you just went through goes to the ability of Canada to defend itself, to be prepared. And I'm, I'm, I am talking about Ukraine, I'm talking about Europe, but I'm focused on the Arctic. I'm focused on continental defense and making sure that Canada and the United States together under the auspices of NORAD are in a position to defend our homeland. And no secret that I don't think the level of spending now is sufficient to be able to accomplish that objective. But I, I do believe what the Canadian government, the Canadian military says to me. By the way, you don't have to take my word for the lack of preparedness. I mean, the, the Canadian military has been, has been politely shouting this from the rooftops, um, that the Canadian armed forces are not adequately prepared and positioned to be able to deal with threats to our homeland. So yes, we'd like to see more spending, but there's a reason for my optimism. I'm not just a, I'm just not looking at this world through rose-colored glasses and because people who I've come to know and respect are telling me that the defense policy update will include additional spending that Canada knows that it, that it needs to further invest in the military, that these comments by the Department of National Defense in the annual report and by Admiral Topshi about the Navy, that they're being heard and they're being paid attention to because there have been some important, significant steps taken by Canada to deal with this. We will continue to wait perhaps less patiently on my side yeah. <laughs> for that update. Ambassador, thank you so much for coming on the show and happy holidays. Well, thank you and happy holidays to you and to your viewers. Thank you. Up next, taking stock after a raucous session of Parliament. While the Conservative leader is only fueled by the sound of his own voice. The Inside Politics panel weighs in. While MPs have headed back to their ridings for the holidays, we want to break down the major stories that dominated the political agenda during this season of Parliament. From speakers' controversies to the carbon tax, and of course, the ongoing political battle between Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and Conservative leader Pierre Polyev. Joining me now to dig into all of this is our Inside Politics panel, Globe and Mail Bureau Chief Robert Fife and Toronto Star's Stephanie Levitz. Great to see you both. We wanted to start out with this, this leadership question of Justin Trudeau because it really has been the background of so much of, of what has happened this fall. And we have a new poll uh, that we wanted to share with you and our viewers for the first time. This is a poll by Ipsos for Global News, and it finds that 69% of Canadians think that Prime Minister Justin Trudeau should resign as leader of the Liberal Party and obviously as Prime Minister in 2024. Steph, what are your thoughts on that? In some ways, you know, that poll, the number is, is high, right? And it reflects the fact that Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's personal popularity has been on a downswing now for month after month after month. And whether it's that people are tired of the, you know, the Liberal government that's been in power as long as it has and are just done, whether they're personally offended by the Prime Minister and what he's done, you know, on various policy issues could be that too. Um, and, and the other thing about it is for the first time, a lot of Canadians, I think, as the polls are suggesting, are looking at the other party, the opposition Conservatives, and taking a look at them thinking, hey, you know what? Like, maybe I could vote for those guys. Okay, I'm feeling confident um, that there's someone else I could vote for, and that's even all the more reason that Prime Minister Justin Trudeau ought to go. Bob, when you look at this poll, does, does that surprise you at all? Do you think he can still turn this around? It doesn't surprise me, and I do not think he can turn it around. And, you know, since 1945, no prime minister has lasted past nine or ten years. He's going into his ninth year. I just do not see a pathway for him to be able to successfully win another election campaign, given the fact that he was unable to win a majority for two campaigns. And if it wasn't for the fact that the Conservatives had uh, weak leaders or problems in the campaigns, he probably would have lost uh, in, the, in 2021 and in 2019. Uh, for whatever reason, people have had it with Trudeau, and I think it was that 
was galvanized over the summer months. And it's not lost on people in the prime minister's office. They're all telling us, and you know, oh, he's going to stay. But they're also talking about, well, who do you think would be the best person to replace him? They're saying, oh, yeah, he's going to stay. But then they start asking you, who do you think is the best person to replace him? <laughs> so they're, they're, they're <laughs> thinking their inside own that own office that um, he's got a few months uh, in the new year to see whether he can change the dynamics of, of uh, his relationship with the Conservatives. So the budget will be important. The, the, you know, they're trying like to attack him as a Trump as a Trump They're trying to attack him as a Trump bite, trying to do as much damage to him as possible with that. Uh, but it may not work because people may be just so tired of Trudeau that the Conservatives could run a fence post and would win. Steph, there has been um, no question a lot of crisis for the government this fall. Some international completely beyond their control, like what happened with Israel and Gaza. Others relatively self-inflicted. When you look back at this past session, what stands out to you? I would say the political fight over the carbon tax is the thing that probably came to dominate from a domestic policy agenda, the thing that came to really dominate the fall session and have a material impact. I mean, the Conservatives, to one degree or another, setting aside Aaron O'Toole's brief foray into some measure of consumer carbon pricing when he was leader of the party, the Conservatives have been against any form of consumer carbon pricing all along. They've been pressing this argument for years. It's fallen on deaf ears, generally speaking. Um, even amongst Canadians as a whole, have you know been willing to accept it, and then something changed, right? We saw the carbon tax itself go up. We saw the price of gas go up. We saw the ec the economy tank and inflation go up, and all of a sudden, all sorts of Canadians across the country, who are broadly supportive of environmental measures, think we need to do something about climate change, begun to throw up their hands and say, "I can't, I can't do it anymore." And when that got really material, you know, in the Atlantic caucus and Atlantic MPs there were hearing that. You know, their constituents, the arguments they were making, their constituents were literally choosing between heating their homes and being able to afford food because of the carbon tax. And to watch the, the federal government and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau walk back this signature part of his policy by removing the carbon tax from home heating fuel, um, that to me was the most sort of fascinating political twist and turn of the fall session because it really did raise a lot of questions about the government's overall climate agenda, how committed they are to it. And the influence, I think, that parts of this caucus now have to drive government policy, perhaps, in a way they haven't before, because as to Bob's point, they still do want to win the next election. Mm -hmm. now, you are starting to see those break points, whether it was people in the Atlantic caucus breaking over the carbon tax, or we've seen people breaking over the position on a ceasefire with Gaza very publicly in ways that we haven't seen the Liberals express that before. Bob, as you look back, what stands out to you as, as sort of these defining moments in, in this session of Parliament? Well, the cost of housing and the cost of living. Um, tr uh, the Conservatives have been really effective at driving home almost every day in the House of Commons, but also in their social media posts and in their campaign um, rallies across the country. The affordability issues of that, the fact that younger people are not going to be able to get a home because they're just out of range for people. You're, you know, you're talking $700,000 to buy a little home. Uh, and it, people can't afford that, especially if they're starting out with young families. And the Conservatives have been very successful at that, and, they've, and they haven't targeted people my age, for example. They've been targeting younger people uh, who are in their late 20s and in their 30s, who want to have, they have young families, they want to have a home, and that's not attainable to them. And you saw the, the, conserva the Liberals will tell you that they missed the boat on this. Now they've been trying to play catch up um, in putting forward a number of, of measures uh, to try to um, alleviate the housing crisis. Um, it's not going to be enough um, because this takes time to work its well, itself through the system. But that has been an issue that they are now scrambling and trying to uh, uh, trying to counter uh, Mr. Polyev's message on that. And the other thing, of course, is cost of living, not just the carbon pricing, which uh, Stephanie's talking about, but, I mean, you go, we go to a grocery store, it's, it's expensive. I mean, a carton of milk is like seven bucks now. Um, and, you know, again, young families or people who don't make a lot of money, they're really struggling. And the conservative message has been very, very good at that. And we've seen the, the government has tried to respond to that as well, bringing in the grocery executives and embassy them and saying, you know, we're going to deal with you. Of course, they haven't done anything about it. But those are two issues that will not go away. And they are a noose hanging around this government's neck. 
Steph, Pierre Polyev has been able to seize quite effectively on those issues, but he has his own risks. What does he have to achieve going into 2024? You know, there's a considerable voter block when we talked about this since the top of the show, right, that say Justin Trudeau has to go. Um, and are they comfortable enough with the opposition leader, conservative leader Pierre Polyev, to, to vote for him? And Mr. Polyev, um, who excels and enjoys the theater of the House of Commons and the cut and threat and the surface level videos, he's very good at it. He's a very clean and clear communicator. Um, but he runs risks when he does things, for example, like this vote against the Ukraine free trade agreement where, you know, the Conservatives were so committed to their ideology around carbon pricing that the fact that the bill sort of vaguely flirts with some language that commits both sides to talking about carbon, never mind Ukraine already has a carbon tax, and Pierre Polyev goes ahead and he votes against the bill. And what does that do? That opens up a door for the Liberals to use the argument that they're using quite effectively that Pierre Polyev's Conservatives are nothing more than the sort of extreme right-wing rump of the Republican Party. And that's a, um, a narrative that's going to hit home for Canadians. And it's going to hit home even more so that if Donald Trump does become the Republican nominee for president in the new year, and then we start the U.S. presidential cycle, and Trump is in the news every day, um, there's room for Canadians to say, oh, God, oh, no, this is not what we want. So Mr. Polyev has to counter that narrative. And he... Don't, I don't know if he thinks he needs to counter it because he prides himself on being anti-establishment, um, and that's worked for him in the past, but it can still be dangerous in that moderate group of voters in you know, suburban ridings in particular that need to come over to him. Well, that's all the time we have for this panel, but uh, I'm sure we'll be talking more about Mr. Trudeau and Mr. Polyev's future when we return, and uh, we thank you both so much for joining us throughout the season. We'll see you next year. Thank you. Thanks. Up next, as the holidays get underway, a reality check on Ottawa's pledge to help Canadians save on their grocery bills. Now for one last thing. It was with much fanfare and outrage that the Liberal government promised to hold grocery store executives accountable for rising food prices, summoning them here to Ottawa and promising results as soon as Thanksgiving flyers were coming out. All that after demanding the grocery execs sign on to a plan to stabilize prices. The government has put a number of measures in place to support you in that, but now we want to see real action when we go to, to, to the stores. And that's what I'm starting to see. Well, here we are at nearly Christmas, and it's not clear that much has changed. Last week, once again, the heads of Canada's largest grocery chains were in Ottawa to be grills. And while it seems that they may be on the industry minister's naughty list, his tone has changed from a directive to more of a plea. And um, we need to get the code over the line. So if there's uh, uh, people watching today, uh, especially the, the people in the grocery sector, we do need to get that over the line. Champagne is trying to entice foreign grocers to increase competition here in Canada. But so far, the Liberal government's plan isn't exactly a gift to those who are spending their hard-earned dollars at the till. That's our show for today. We'll see you next Sunday.